15 unique bourbon distilleries within 45 miles of downtown. That's what you can expect in Lexington, Kentucky, the bourbon lover's ultimate playground. Lexington is the perfect hub for your bourbon infused vacation and Visit Lex will help you create the perfect itinerary along the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. For more information, go to visitlex.com, that's V-I-S-I-T-L-E-X.com and discover all the ways to enjoy the horse and in our opinion, bourbon, capital of the world. With Liquor Barn, you can shop your favorite bourbon, that perfect bottle of wine, or discover something new. To place an order for pickup or delivery, download the Liquor Barn app, visit liquorbarn.com, or call your nearest Liquor Barn location. Follow us on social media and subscribe to our email list for all the latest news on products, promotions, and events. Liquor Barn, where Kentuckians go to celebrate life. Cheers! Welcome to the Bourbon Life Podcast, your source for all things bourbon. Join your hosts, Mark and Matt, as they drink and review bourbons, share news about upcoming events, interview the who's who in the bourbon world, and most importantly, bring you along for the fun of living the bourbon life. Now, here's your hosts, Mark and Matt. All right, everybody, welcome back for another episode of the Bourbon Life Podcast. I'm your host, Mark, and with me, as always, live tonight around the Bourbon Life table is my good friend, Matt. Matt, what's going on, man? Hey, not much, Mark. You doing all right tonight? I'm I'm doing great, man. We we had a pretty awesome weekend, did we not? We sure did. It was <laughs> uh, the Kentucky Bourbon Festival, right? Goodness gracious, man. Here we are. We are in the heart of Bourbon Heritage Month, September yeah. 2020. Yeah. And what better way than... <laughs> to go to the Kentucky Bourbon Festival. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Did we ever have a day? Weather was nice, a little it was. warm. But it was a little warm. Nobody was complaining about that. It certainly could have been a lot worse for us. But Yeah, and you know, and last year uh, I had COVID, so I wasn't able to go. You went last year. I did go last year. Um, and the year before it was all, it was online, it was digital. Because the COVID, uh, the pandemic had everything really shut down. So, and believe it or not, Matt, that's the first time I've gone to the Bourbon Festival. I've never been before. Uh, you made a statement. <laughs> I'm just wondering if they'll let me ever come back. <laughs> well, they've got 360 something days to Man. smooth over. Man, yeah, but they're they, letting they, us in. They did a great job. Oh, and, it you know, was amazing. I mean, it was a great setup. The environment was great. The way they had everything, you know, craft distilleries on one side, the the main distilleries on the other side, the food vendors in the back. You could buy bottles on on site there. Mm-hmm. Um, live entertainment, the VIP tent for food and everything else. And, uh, Dave Mandel, the chairman, he was on our show a couple of weeks ago. I mean, Dave took great care of us. Just a great guy, man. Love everything that he's doing. So Mm -hmm. he took great care of us and Randy Prossy and Steve Coombs, who are also with them. And Randy's the president, but man, they, their whole team, they just did a a stellar job. I would say. Yeah, I agree. I think as, as Dave was saying, it's, it's Bardstown their weekend to roll out the red carpet. Yeah. They did an amazing job of it. Yeah. I'm already looking forward to next year. Right. <laughs> and, you know, they had Bourbon and Beyond this weekend, too, which we did not attend uh, up in Louisville, the music festival. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm not sure how people were able to do Bardstown Bourbon Festival or the Kentucky Bourbon Festival during the day and <laughs> then go to Louisville and do the music at night. So it was a little, yeah. I don't know. I think I'm too old for that, Matt. <laughs> well, a little power nap goes a long way, right? <laughs> and having a designated driver. Absolutely. That was, goes even further. Yeah. Mrs. Bourbon Life was our designated driver. So she took <laughs> she took really good care of us, gotten a, getting us back from the festival uh, Friday and Saturday night. Um, but yeah, so we are the Bourbon Life Podcast presented by Visit Lex. I did want to say that. Uh, we also want to thank all of our sponsors uh, for everything that they do for us. Uh, Matt, with that said, man, you want to tell everybody who we have with us tonight? Let's do it. So we are sponsored by Visit Lex, and we are keeping it here in Lexington this evening because we have joining us Mark Kaufman, and he is the master distiller of Town Branch Distillery here in Lexington. Mark, welcome to the Bourbon Life Podcast. No, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's so great to finally get you on. I know we've been talking about it, and what better time than here during Bourbon Heritage Month when we're talking about the local status, the local distilleries, our local celebrities. So we're great, very, very great to have you here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we appreciate you coming. You're here live in the studio. This is great because uh, Dave Mandel came up a couple of weeks ago. And we've had the chance to record live with him as well. So, you know, we, we can record online, which during the pandemic was good for us because we didn't have to get, we didn't have to travel. We didn't have to be face to face with everybody. Um, and it allowed us to record online, which was great. Uh, but I really prefer, I, 
I prefer to be able to sit down with somebody and get to talk to them face to face and share a few pours with them. So we appreciate you coming out. Uh, now, are you, do you live here in Lexington? Woodford County. Okay. All right. So you're close. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty close. So well, we appreciate you taking the time this evening to come and hang out with us here in the Bourbon Life. The, we call it the Bourbon Life Studios, otherwise known as my basement. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we appreciate you being here with us. So before we jump into everything, um, and I always I usually forget to do this, I should say, but you want to tell everybody what we had poured up on this uh, first round that we're going to be tasting? Yeah, what we have first is our standard uh, Town Branch 90 proof bourbon. Uh, age is going to be right about five, five and a half years. Okay. Right in that range. Is that now? Is that a standard age for most of the releases on the? I mean, is that you keep it that, or does it get older over time, or how do you guys do that? Uh, the, the bourbon, uh, I really would love to get more age onto it. Unfortunately, we're selling too much. Oh, that's a good. Pro- <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it's a good problem to have, right? <laughs> so we're 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 keeping we're keeping the age right where it is right now. Okay. Uh, trying to hold back a little bit of barrels, but uh, it, it, business has been good. So yeah, well, that's good. Well, the, I mean, the whole industry is booming, so that's great to hear that you guys are booming right along right along with it and you were lexington we'll talk about that a little bit later but um lexington's first distillery again since prohibition right so that's right yeah we started yeah. back up distilling in 2008 okay great yeah we'll jump into that the second round but i just wanted everybody to know up right up front that that town branch was the the first one back here in lexington um i've been here for 30 plus odd years so it was great to I mean, I've always been a big fan of the brewing <laughs> side of it. <laughs> uh, beer is my, usually my drink of choice, but uh, bourbon is is right up there as well now these days. Uh, so it's great to have you guys here in town. I, I, I love that. Um, so now this is, uh, so this is five, five and a half years. What's the, can you tell us what the mash bill is on it? Yeah, this mash bill is going to be 72 corn. Okay. 15 rye and okay. 13 malted barley. Okay. All right. That that sounds good. So that's kind of a little bit, well, not really a high malted barley, but higher than a lot of the brands go to. Is there a reason that you guys do that for? P- part of it had to do with the heritage of the company itself. Uh, okay. Uh, being uh, the, send, the owner's descendants from Ireland. Okay. You know, the Lions family. Uh, I, I'll tell you a story. When uh, I got the stills up and ready to start up two weeks before we started up, in 2008, I went to Pierce. I says, you know, we're two weeks out to start up. Uh, you want me to go ahead and put together a bourbon recipe? You know, we're right in the heart of bourbon country. And he says, oh, hell no, Mark. He says, I'm Irish. I want a good malt whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's what we started with. So that's what you, you malt. started with, a, a single malt whiskey. Yeah, that's right. How funny. Right in the heart of bourbon country. That's, yeah. that's awesome. For so, how long did you run that before getting some bourbon laid down? That lasted till the end of December, and there was a local, a new distillery in Lexington that announced they were going to uh, start making bourbon in Lexington again. And I happened to be up real early that morning during Christmas break. It was like December 23rd or 4th, something like that. And I'm reading the paper, and I see this. And uh, I got on my phone and I text a couple of my guys. I says, how long is it going to be until Pierce sends the orders out this at, today before he tells us to start making bourbon right away? And it lasted <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> it was before <laughs> 7 o'clock that morning he told us, well, let's start making some bourbon. So we did. Wow, that's great. Yeah, well, and we'll talk about uh, Dr. Lyons a little bit more because I think he's a I – I, I met him once, but I didn't really get to – I never got to work with him or anything, but I just – from what I understand, just a great guy and – everything that he did for the whole community here. So I definitely want to jump in and talk some more about him in that, in that second round. Uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Now the bourbon that you guys produce, is it, is it non-chill filtered or do you guys chill filter or do you filter it? Or no, all? it's non-chill non- filter. Okay. All right. That's, that's a good, has that always been the case? That no, was the decision? Or? Early on we, we did chill filter and about three years ago we uh, stopped chill filtering. Was there, I mean, a decision, just be, or was it just because of the way the market was kind of moving? The, the, the market was moving that way, right? And uh, there's there's the pros and cons of doing it. Uh, you know, some some very specific or sophisticated tastes you might be able to pick up. Okay. Uh, some most people won't. Right. Right. But uh, it was the, the trend at the time. Yeah, and I guess you know some people freak out when they put ice or they if they refrigerate their bourbon or whatever and it chills down and it gets all cloudy and they're like what my bourbon's gone bad what's wrong with it 
Um, You're not drinking it fast enough. That's right. You need to drink <laughs> it faster. Yeah. It's past the expiration date. You got to hurry up next time. <laughs> so Matt, let's uh, let's jump in and get some nosing on this. What do you, what do you think in terms of the the nose on the on the bourbon? What are you picking up? It's really pleasant. I will, first off, I was not expecting to hear this was five five and a half years for all of it coming straight out, and that's that's really nice to hear. But it's got a really pleasant nose, really fresh. I get a really great aroma of like really nice grain, really just clean, not like distillate, but just a good clean nose of like the corn and the grain coming through. It's got a lot of caramel. I get like the, I've said this before with another one, but kind of like the bit of honey candies. Oh yeah. Yeah. So there's like a little caramel, definitely some honey, but like a nice sugary sweetness to it as well. I think maybe some of the age is playing through with some of the oak on it too, but it's also, there's some bright, I think the rye, there's a little peppercorn, a little mint. Yep. Like just something a little fresh near the end too. Uh, yeah, I like it quite a bit. This is, this is a really nice nose. Yeah, I agree. You know, to me, it kind of came across on the nose, almost like uh, almost kind of like butterscotch. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe that's just the honey caramel combination to me that translates kind of like a butterscotch aroma. Um, but Matt, you talking about the bit of honey? Does that does that pick up any nuttiness to you? Because bit of honey actually did have little had nuts in it. I think didn't it? Little chips and nuts. Bit mm-hmm. bit of. Or did it not? I don't know. I can't confirm that. But <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I'm not getting too much not of a, nutty. a nutty aroma okay. off this. But I get do a little. They still make bit of honey. I don't know if they do or not, but I love that as a kid. Yeah, I mean, I uh, absolutely loved bit of honey. They were delicious. <laughs> but I agree with you, Matt. And there is that brightness to it as well, like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, which it's it's. I mean, the rye on it was what was it? Thirteen? Was fifteen? It? Fifteen. Okay. All right. So nice mid range rye there. So you, yeah, to pick up some of that, it's really. It is really nice. Mark, what about you? Did we, did we miss anything no, we should no, ask? Those, those are getting all the targets right there. I mean, yeah. Uh, you, you, uh, Matt, you, you said it exactly, and like I would say it too, and it just comes out just really like that. A little bit of that peppers. Some of that mint aspect comes through to it too, and it, but, the, but the sweetness really comes through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really like that. Um, so, Mark, let's talk about you. Let's talk about your background where you're from and how you got into the industry. So where, where do you hail from originally? I was uh, brought up in Northwest Indiana. Okay. Born in Gary, Indiana. Yeah. Okay. Lived in Hammond and Munster, that area till I was about 13. Then my dad transferred to Des Moines, Iowa. And then I lived there for about nine years, went through high school and college there at that point. Then, uh, the peak of the recession, no, in the you, early 80s. Where, I have to ask you, where, where'd you go to college? You, you get to the, IU? Des Moines, Com- okay. Des Moines Area Community <laughs> College, sure. I was making sure you weren't an IU guy. I mean, no, you know, just, no. Just making sure. <laughs> if it would have been, it would have been Iowa State. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> but um, no, when I got done with school, uh, the recession was at its peak in the early 80s, and uh, jobs were hard to get. Sure. Uh, my degree was in building trades. Uh, so home construction was out of the picture because interest rates were running the mid teens at that time. Right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I took a job with uh, mean services, uh, the research and development department out of Chicago. Yeah. I moved all my stuff to Kentucky where my dad had transferred again to back in 1979. Uh, cause I was only going to be home six days a month. Yeah. So. I worked on this road crew for about two and a half years, picked up a lot of experience on electrical and mechanical work. Uh, so that was mostly the job is, is a lot of piping, a lot of electrical yeah. r- running and setting the machines up and testing them out and rebuilding them. Uh, so, so that's, that's where I got started with, with that, that business. But, but that led me into uh, the experience that got me my job at Alltech in 1986. Okay. So that's how long I've been with the company. Wow, 30, 36 years. Yeah. Yeah, that's a long time for one company. That's great. Yeah, you don't hear that much no, anymore. No, you, you definitely do not. That's right. It's even hard to find someone there for 36 months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that got me in the door there, working in the maintenance department. Then within a year, I, I was managing that. Then within a couple of years, I was managing all the projects and engineering for the corporation worldwide. Wow. And that, and. And we'll talk some more about Alltech, but it's a it's a very large company, and we can we'll talk yeah. some more about that in the second round. So it's not just you weren't hired by Town Branch Distilling no. to come in and work. You, this was Alltech, which is a multinational. I mean, it's a huge corporation, um, and we, like I said, we can talk about that some more. So, how was it that you transitioned from that role into what you're what you do now? Well, of course, you, you spend so many decades on the road, and after a while, it gets kind of old. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I've, I've been responsible for us uh, getting into the brewing, buying the brewery, uh, setting up that equipment, the expan- expansions on the breweries. Then uh, when Pierce wanted to put the stills in, he called me on a Sunday in, in uh, February in 08 and said, I want to put some stills in the, the brewery. I'm a practical thinker, and the brewery's not very big. Yeah. And I says, well, where are we going to put those pairs? He says, ah, that's tomorrow's problem, Mark. Don't worry about it. So that told me it's my problem, <laughs> not to bother him with it. But he told me he, he met with Richard Forsythe, uh, the great manufacturer of Forsythe stills. They, they probably do about 70% of all the pot stills in Scotland and Ireland. Okay. So it's a big company. And uh, sure enough, uh, I come in the office 8 o'clock Monday morning and Phone rings and it's Richard Forsythe. I said, oh, I met with Pierce yesterday and he told me to put together a project for some stills. And I said, Well, what'd you come up with, Richard? And he says, Well, I come through the shop this morning and talking to the lads. And they said, You know, Richard, we got two stills sitting out in the yard that <laughs> such and such hasn't paid a penny on for <laughs> nine months. I says, What does that mean for me, Richard? He says, Well, I. They, they told me this is how much it is, and oh, wow. you, know, you get us a down payment, we'll get started on it. i got about five weeks left to do on it, and, and we'll ship them to you. Oh, wow. So we, we signed the contract that afternoon, wired them the down payment that afternoon. Uh, wow. then by, so you hardly, you hardly had any chance to think about it. No, <laughs> I mean, there, just, yeah. no thought. No. I mean, as soon as I got that, I got drawings. So they just told me I'd get, take it to the next gear, start getting my guys together. Okay, here's what we got to do. Here's where we're going to fit it in. Uh, this is what we got to do. We got to have electric there. We got to have the rough in for the mechanical, for the steam, for the cooling water. All that had to be roughed in. Mm-hmm. And the drawings were very good. So we were able to rough in everything without interfering with the main installation. And that was putting the stills in. So we, when uh, the stills arrived May 1st, uh, we shoehorned them in. Yeah. We literally had a quarter inch of free play to get it down the ramp between <laughs> block walls from the bottom of the wash still to the top of the flange. Oh, man. And the guys shoehorned it in there. We, we set them up, and then it was about uh, September 1st, we started the stilling. So everything went went good. And you became the master distiller. Yeah, well, I I, I guess I got lucky. Yeah. I mean, I mean, really, I walked into it. I didn't see anything there that I couldn't do or didn't understand. Uh, with my experience with Alltech from the early years on, I had a wealth of experience in fermentation. Yeah. And, and how to, to maintain, uh, you know, back, we were growing bacteria, but same, we were, we were producing a lot of yeast, too. Yeah. So, so we had all that background, and all really, all I had to do was come up with the concept of how how we distill, and I I didn't find anything on it that was a hurdle I couldn't pass. Gotcha. So now that was in 2012 when we actually started distilling, right? 2008. 2008. Okay, gotcha. And then, but the the brewing was already going. You guys had purchased that. We we had purchased the Lexington Brewing Company's equipment. Okay. In October of '99. Okay. And uh, we bought it with no intentions of making beer. <laughs> okay. uh, we were down there. Pier- Pearson called me up a Sunday afternoon in October. We're watching a Cleveland football game. Tim Couch was playing first year. Yeah, nice. Okay. Yeah. So right. everyone would follow him at that time, you know, local kid making NFL. Right. So uh, Pierce calls me and says, hey, tomorrow morning, why don't you go down to Lexington Brewing Company, take a look and, and see about, see if we buy some of that, some of the tanks there, because we're always needing some tanks at corporate. And I said, well, I'm heading to Mexico City in the morning. Can we get out there this evening? So a couple phone calls later, we end up down there. Yeah. And we look around. It's got a bottling line. It's got a little kegging line. It's got a cooler. It had a little old dairy truck that they delivered beer around in. It had a brew house down the ramp and some horizontal milk tanks they used as fermenters. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, within a few minutes, a couple numbers got thrown around. We bought it. We bought the equipment. Wow. Okay? Yeah. Now, it had a 1950 Shidling Brewing Company bottling line. Okay. It was ornery as all get out because it was the boss most of the time. <laughs> but uh, we, we bought it for the tanks, and the price was really good. So I ended up leasing the building for six months because I didn't have a place to take it out, take the equipment out, and put it somewhere else. Right, yeah. right. Okay? But every year since I've been with the company, 
we've always sponsored a big conference. Okay. Then it was called the the annual feed symposium. Okay. Now it's called the One Conference in Lexington. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, huge, huge conference. Yeah. And, and back in 2000, we had about 1,700 people come in from world, worldwide. Wow. And usually we're buying kegs of beer. We're entertaining our clients and having a good time for, for three and a half days. And uh, we got talking about it. So yeah, this is kind of silly, us entertaining that way. We got the brewery downtown. We had an alcohol division that sold uh, yeast and enzymes in the industry. And we had two brewmasters on staff. Huh. So let's, we said, Let, let's make a beer for the symposium. So we did. <laughs> so we made a few hundred barrels of that, and that's what what you have now is the Kentucky Ale. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. The Irish Red Ale that 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 you'll see in the market now, and that that's what we started with, and everyone loved it. And so you ought to make a go for it. And so the the early part, early years of the brewery, it was mostly used as a marketing tool for the corporation. I got gotcha. you. So now, were you involved with that part of it, that aspect of it, in the brewing and everything? Oh, most certainly, yeah. So were you the master brewer? Is no, that, no, oh, not okay. at that time. No, okay. no, I just made sure everything was going good. If they needed to equip, and I'd get the equipment in, but gotcha. let the master brewers do their thing. Yeah, very cool. And you guys make one of my favorite beers, the uh, the Bourbon Barrel Ale. Yeah, that's right. Which is, at, how long have you all been making that one? I've been making that since 2005. Yeah, man, that's, Matt, I know you're not a big beer drinker, but... Let me tell you, that bourbon barrel, that's a, that's a game changer yeah. <laughs> if, if you haven't had it, man. It's still a uh, big seller. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it is because that's uh, – I remember when I first discovered it, I was like, yep, this is going to be my beer. And it's, to me, you know, in the, in the summer and spring, I like to drink lighter beers, whatever. But, man, the fall and the winter, that bourbon barrel ale is always on my on my rotation for sure. Yeah. It's it's absolutely delicious. So, well, that's, that's really cool how you got involved with this and how you started – now you're the master distiller. I mean, that's just a great story. You've been there long enough and uh, got the experience and everything. So that's just, that's really cool. Matt, let's jump back and talk about the uh, palate and the finish on this, uh, this bourbon that we're drinking here. 90 proof again. So five and a half years, five to five and a half years. So what do you think about it? It's got a nice sweetness from the corn right up front that I pick up. Then yeah. the, the rye lends through to a little bit of spicy kind of mid front palate, some peppercorn with it, well, maybe a little cinnamon, a little baking spice. But what I'm really picking up are like nice honey and like a chamomile. It's got like a nice kind of floral sort of springtime chamomile type yeah. flavor to it. Like really, really, really nice, really inviting, um, good long finish. It's it's nice where it should be for 80 proof or excuse me, 90 proof. Um, it's a good, solid, staple workhorse bourbon. Now, I will tell you, to me, this actually drinks a little warmer than 90 proof. I would agree, actually. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, does it, if you get that same sensation as well, mm-hmm. maybe in the low hundreds, possibly even, or at least 100, maybe maybe somewhere right around there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, very sweet on the palate. Um, but then you get that spiciness, like you said, Matt, it comes across more like a cinnamon. Uh, and with that sweetness, it kind of has that, that cinnamon red hot candy, you know, the sugary sweetness. Um, and then you get that cinnamon kick from the, from the rye. Uh, but again, a very nice long finish. Like you said, coats the mouth, coats the glass very nice yeah, as well. It's good call um, on that. It is. It's nice and oily. Good yeah, coating. It's on the very mouth, oily. The it's, and that's from that, that non-chill filtering. Yep. Of, yeah. That leaves those nice oils in there. And you can see it in the glass as well as it clings and runs down the side. Um, very nice. Mark, what about you? What, in terms of the taste profile and palate, what do you, what do you get on that? Well, uh, I've, I find this one here is relatively smooth to drink. Uh, you really don't need ice or anything like right. this at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's nice just, just at need at room temperature. Yeah. Uh, it just goes down real smooth. It, it just has that slight warming texture as, as you swallow it. It lingers a little bit. But that's almost telling you, come on, let's have another sip. That's what I was say. This yeah. one, this is one you could – you start sipping on it, and you're like, yeah, I could probably have a little more of that. And then, yeah, maybe – be, we'd be like the Kentucky Bourbon Festival all over again, Matt. <laughs> it's very inviting. <laughs> so, Mark, have you have you been a bourbon drinker, or were you a bourbon drinker uh, before you started doing this? Or I I would drink it, but it wasn't one of my my top sure. things at the time. Uh, I've always enjoyed beer. Still do enjoy a, a good beer. Yeah. Uh, anytime you can have two or three beers and just sit and relax, I enjoy that. But uh, I've come to develop. Uh, 
more of the taste toward the bourbons and in the malts too. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've got a distillery in Ireland too. So we've got a lot of the malts that, that we're doing at that. Yeah. Time. That's what I'm going to talk to you about that too. in another round about that, about your Ireland. But, but uh, as far as my taste and, and what I prefer, it, it's the best of both worlds because I've got a lot of diversity there and it really depends on my mood. Sure. Which, which direction I'll go. Yeah. That's nice. That's a good, that's a good place to be. You know, what they want a beer today or do I want some single malt or do I want some bourbon, maybe some rye, maybe some, you guys make, we'll talk about that too. All the other products you guys make, you got quite a selection down there. So that's a lot of fun. Well, guys, I'll tell you what, let's take a quick break, um, get a word from our sponsors and, uh, then we'll come back for round two and we'll talk some more about the distillery itself. Everybody just sit tight. We'll be right back with Mark Kaufman, the master distiller at Town Branch Distillery. Spirits of French Lick crafts their spirits using only the finest agricultural product that has defined character, following their motto, respect the grain. They lead the way in representing the quality of the Hoosier artisan distilling process while paying tribute to its inseparable past. By implementing best practices from those early times, combined with modern touches, Spirits of French Lick has created a truly unique place in the industry. Spirits of French Lick products are distributed throughout Indiana, Kentucky, and Missouri, and can also be purchased online through Sealbox at sealbox.com. Visit spiritsoffrenchlick.com to learn more information and make sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. The Stave Restaurant is a bourbon lover's paradise right here in the heart of bourbon country. Located at 5711 McCracken Pike in Millville, Kentucky, between Castle and Key and Woodford Reserve, Chef Kyle Klatka prepares amazing food each day that features an elevated Kentucky-inspired cuisine. With a full service bar, great bourbon flights, and signature cocktails, the Stave is the perfect place to catch up with friends after a fun-filled day of touring local distilleries. Be sure to check them out online at thestavekentucky.com or at Instagram and Facebook at The Stave Kentucky. All right, everybody, welcome back for round two of the Bourbon Life Podcast. I'm your host, Mark, and still with me live here in the Bourbon Life Studios, it's my good friend, Matt. Matt, thanks for sticking around, man. Oh, Mark, come on. I'm not going to leave you high and dry. You know that. <laughs> I appreciate that. I thought you might live me this weekend, though, at the Bourbon Festival, you know? No way. I Are you kidding? I'm not going to give up your, <laughs> your coattails. I've been riding them this long. Why on earth would I stop? Oh, man. You know, and I hate to keep going back to that, but how fun was it, though, to finally get to meet and see just all these people, you know, that we have we've recorded shows with and, you know... Uh, people that we're friends with on social media that you've never, you know, I've never met, mm -hmm. just talk to them through Instagram or Facebook. Uh, and then also some of our listeners were there. And it was funny that, because you and I don't do a lot. I mean, we don't, I put more pictures up, obviously, than, than you. You're never on the on the Instagram uh, page at all. But, you know, I've had a few pictures up. But it was really fun to have people come up and just say, hey, man, I love what you guys are doing. I love your show. Really appreciate it. Um it's just kind of affirming <laughs> after two and a half years yeah. that we're not wasting our time, right? <laughs> oh, hardly. I mean, even if my parents are the only one listening, they're enjoying it. So. <laughs> That's right. I'm glad your parents listen, man. Yeah. Definitely. All right, man. So we are the Bourbon Life Podcast presented by Visit Lex. We appreciate their sponsorship and everything that they, they do for us, as well as all of our sponsors. We appreciate them. And with that said, Matt, you want to tell everybody who we have with us? Absolutely. We have the master distiller at Town Branch Distilling, also known as Alltech Distilling, and we'll get into that in just a second here. But Mark Kaufman, Mark, he's back. Welcome again for the second round of the Bourbon Life Podcast. Oh, I'm glad I'm still here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we pre well, we closed the gate, you know, so you can't you can't yeah. get out of the you can't get out of the basement, Mark. I'm sorry to it's it's childproof. Too. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Matt, you said Mark. Mark, he is back, and it sounded like you said Mark, he's back. <laughs> so Marky, Marky's back with us. So that's that's great. <laughs> well, Mark, he is back too. Yeah. <laughs> but what if we've got something great poured up, something different, a little experimental, right? Yeah. Poured up for this round. This was uh, very experimental. We had come across uh, uh, someone that had some ex bourbon barrels that put his maple syrup into it and aged some maple syrup to get a little bit of a bourbon essence to it. And uh, once he was done with that, uh, we bought those barrels from him, and we decided to put some, make some imperial stout and put it into those barrels. Okay. So we did that. We aged them for about six months uh, just to make that product, and it was a very nice uh, maple stout that, that we came up with. It was, it was very pleasurable to drink. Um, but then, then we said, well, we got these, these 40 barrels. What are we going to do? So we said, let's put some bourbon into it. 
So we, we took some four-year-old bourbon, put them into it, and we aged them in there for, for one year. Okay. So And this uh, is just the standard bourbon kind yeah. of that we were drinking, yep. 72, 15, 13? Yeah, sa- same bourbon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just at four years of age, we, we took it out and, and put it into these barrels. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So we stored them there for one year. Um, I noticed right off the bat it's a lot darker color. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can uh, definitely see that. It's the same bourbon, but, but it just did that secondary aging, that stout barrel. And this is at 94 proof, right? Is that correct? Yeah. So a little bit higher proof, but um, actually after with that additional year in the barrel, so it's still, it's right at five years yeah. now. And I guess with the, the TTB, then they changed their requirements recently, right? So now you can add on, can't you add on the time in the finishing barrel to the, the actual time in the, in the original barrel to say it's a five-year-old bourbon? I think that's right. Didn't somebody tell us that on the show? It's, was it Greg? Said, it's one way or the other. Either was you it Greg can Snyder? add it or you can't add it. I think I th- you can. I think it was Greg Snyder that yeah. told us that, that, that they, that TTB changed their regulations or something that, you know, cause used to, it would have to be, oh, this is a four year old bourbon aged in a whatever cask. Um, but now you can actually add the time that it has spent in that second cask to the original age statement and say that it's a five year old. That's what I've told. Uh, I've not double checked that. <laughs> no. I don't know if that's right or not. Mark, Anything so. with the TTB, you always have to double check. And then uh, you're yeah. still going to scratch your head. Trying to interpret <laughs> what trying to say. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's an interesting question. When you guys started doing this, was that something that you all worked on in house, or did you have someone that actually assisted you all hire outside counsel to work and do do all that headache? No, no, we work? did that all in house. Did you really? Yeah. Cause I've heard that it's quite, I'm an attorney by trade, but I do real estate law. So I can't imagine, I, you know, I look at some of the things that the regulations and I'm like, I can't even begin to imagine what it would be like to have to comply with all that. And it's hard. There's, there's no manual that pulls out every aspect that you got to know. You have to really dig into it yourself. Right. And uh, try to understand. Uh, I mean, just, just like your simple filing every month. Uh, there's three forms you have to do, and you have to determine: is it storage, is it process, is it production? Yeah. And uh, and these things aren't cut dry. You have to understand mm-hmm. what the definition is. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I kind of got off track there. Matt's looking at me like, "Where are you going with this?" Because we were talking about this this bourbon that you poured up, and I went off on this TTB tangent. So we'll jump back to the to the bourbon. So you had the you had the barrels. They had maple syrup in them. Then you put your your stout in it. Your imperial yep. stout. And you took it out and you put the uh, 40 barrels. Is that what you, that's about what you, 40 barrels? 40 barrels. Okay. 94 proof. Um, so aged four years plus the additional year in the barrel. Yep. So yeah, great. So I had to give a shout out to Chad, uh, our buddy, at my daily bourbon, because actually earlier today I ran into him and he's like, man, I hope you guys get to taste that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that maple, uh, finish because that maple stout finish. Cause it's, it's great. Um, so Chad, here you go, man. This is, this is for you, Matt. What do you pick up on this on the nose? Well, first we were talking about the color first noticeably. It's just the rich Amber Auburn color of it. It's just a really, really gorgeous color and nice, nice hue to it. Um, the nose for me, I get a lot of like dark cocoa. Uh, there's like a mocha, almost like a little bit of a roasty coffee ish, but not so much on the coffee, just like a slight undertone. Yeah. And then to me, there's, it's, it's warm. It's got a nice warm nose, like a little hotter than more cinnamon. It's almost like a Mexican dark chocolate or hot chocolate, kind of like that cinnamon, uh, cocoa, but not as sweet as what we were nosing before. I think it comes off a lot more savory and a little warmer on the nose. Really inviting though. Yeah, I agree with that. And the color, you know, to me, it looks almost like a seven or eight year old bourbon in, in the glass, you know, and a 94 proof, um, it's a, just, a, it's a beautiful color again. And this one's clean and I'm shaking, you know, moving it around the glass. Again, you get that nice oiliness, the legs on the glass, the color is really pretty. Uh, the aroma is funny because I was, I was thinking, I'm going to go in and like smell all this maple and I don't really, you don't really pick up maple, right. And you don't mm-hmm. pick up, I, I mean, cause I love stout beers and I don't really pick up a stout flavor but matt you mentioned that kind of like roasted maybe coffee something like yeah, that kind of like so, a multi roast yeah coffee so i can see that and i'm guessing that probably is coming from that stout possibly because i mean a stout's made it's a dark dark beer right so it's heavily roasted yeah yeah so so maybe picking that up as well but 
um, yeah, totally different profile, obviously, than the mm-hmm. than the ninety proof bourbon that we just had, but really inviting and very very nice. So, Mark, what about you? What do you get in terms of the? Yeah, I, I agree with with your summary so far, but I'd add probably one thing is that I don't get any of the maple aspect, but I do get the the heavily roasted uh, malt for the the imperial stout I, mm-hmm. that comes out in the taste. Uh, it almost gives you a little bit of a dryness to your tongue okay. uh, as you're drinking that. Uh, but it's got those nice peppery notes, uh, the, the cinnamon bang almost right at the beginning that you get. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, so we, we talked about, you talked about the brand. Um, let's let's talk about um, Alltech, right? Let's talk about... Let's talk about Alltech. I was just thinking, I was like, <laughs> we haven't done that yet, have we? Let, let, let's, we need to do that. So you talked about Alltech being a huge corporation, huge business. Um, a lot of people outside of Lexington may not be familiar with, with that. Can you talk about the history of Alltech just so people understand how Town Branch, Lexington Brewing and yeah. Brewery and Distilling fits in with Alltech and everything? Well, well Alltech, uh, when I started with the company in 86, I was the 19th employee. Wow. So it was, it was a small company. Yeah. Uh, we were, just had the one office there in Nicholasville. It started in some rental suites in on gold rush road in lexington okay before that uh but then in 86 when i started uh 60 of the business was in the fuel ethanol side okay uh yeast and enzymes that supported that business but pierce had seen an opportunity with his background in phd with uh not just nutrition, but but yeast and what you can do with yeast and the, the benefits you have with yeast going into nutrition and he's seen that there was a big opportunity with the distillers that no one's really capitalized at the time, and that was uh, the syrup coming off the, the distillation process. That's a separation from the grains after distillation. Okay. It's a high-protein material. Uh, so, so he developed a couple of products off of that, and, and that, that led to uh, a number of other products. But that, that really was what took Alltech from – a fuel ethanol company are supporting that the fuel ethanol business and brewing business into the feed business that, or but but we, we never got involved with the feed it was always nutritional uh materials that we made that were all natural that went into feed okay we didn't own, own any feed mills at that time right so and when you're saying feed you're talking about livestock and yeah animals. all performance so, yeah. animals yeah yeah it okay. could be cattle it could be poultry it could be a uh, swine okay horses uh, but like you'd said earlier, most people would not have known or recognized Alltech. Uh, for the longest time, people thought we were the phone company, Alltel. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't until 2010 when Pierce became the sponsor for the FEI World Equestrian Games right. that people finally knew what Alltech was. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that put us on the board at that point. Yeah, yeah, because I remember that, that you know, the the – Publicity and that name, Alltech, I mean, and Alltech Arena, I mean, out at the horse park, everything, um, all the involvement and everything that, that was done in the community for that event and, and uh, everything Alltech has done. But Dr. Lyons is a pretty unique, was a very unique individual himself. And like I said earlier off, off the air, I mean, I had the opportunity to meet him once, but never really had the opportunity to get to know him or, or work with him. But uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about Dr. Lyons? Oh, he, he was a character. I mean... Very intelligent, uh, would pick up on a conversation real quick. Uh, he would read people very fast. Yeah. Uh, very uh, very charitable guy, too. I mean, the, the guy gave a lot. And yeah. uh, he was probably one of the bigger ambassadors to the state, more so sometimes than the governor is. Yeah. I mean, this <laughs> guy always touted Kentucky. You know, he loved it. He loved it when he came from Ireland. Uh, when he got into the bluegrass area, it just reminded him of home. Right. With the green rolling hills. So he just loved Kentucky. And uh, that, that was really, really yeah. what got him going. Which is really cool because you think back to the, you know, to the years like the potato famine, et cetera, when we had a large inflow of Irish immigrants, uh, a lot of them settled here in, in Kentucky. My family in eastern Kentucky actually was from Ireland. Um, but a lot of people settled here in eastern Kentucky. Uh, reminiscent of their home. I've never had the fortune to visit Ireland, but my parents have. And the pictures, you know, it looks very similar. The rolling hills, the green grass, the stone fences that a lot of the Irish uh, settlers here actually built 
and that still stand. I mean, I can see where he would, yeah, he could feel like he was at home almost. In both areas, there's not a straight road in either country or either state. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth, man? Yeah. Especially when you get outside of downtown Lexington, man, and these roads are just, they're nuts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but they're beautiful. They're they're a lot of fun to, uh, a lot of fun to drive on for sure. Um, so Matt, you want to go back and talk a little bit more about this palette on this one? I know uh, Mark had kind of gotten into that just a little bit, but... Sure. Uh, what do you what do you think in terms of the palette on this one in the finish? <clears throat> Definitely pick up the malt. It's it's really roasty. It's got those roasted malt flavors. I get the cocoa. This is where some more of that chocolate's coming through. The dark like toasted malt. Think of like brown sugary. Um, some of the the maples coming through, but I get more again of like those imperial stout flavors. Kind of like the coffee, like a dark vanilla. Um, surprisingly enough i think the rye is really coming through for me too there's like cinnamon i almost pick up like a little clove a little orange as well and kind of like some christmas yeah spices with it are coming through but a nice nice finish with it you were right it does leave um kind of that dry warm heat in the mouth as well on the finish but i'm usually not one much for for beer barrel finishes but this is quite pleasant i really actually quite t- quite take to this and like it a lot and, and when he says that he's not a fan of <laughs> i mean he's not kidding because very seldom does he drink a beer you know a stout or any type of barrel finished um whiskey that he's a that he's a fan of so i was curious to see what your thoughts were on this one but i agree i mean and you know talking about the the malt I mean, it drinks somewhat like a single malt. I mean, it has that kind of aroma, that flavor mm-hmm. um, on the palate. Yeah, kind of like a smoky, yeah, but um, inviting. Not certainly not peaty. Not peaty. Yeah. yeah, not a smoked peat where it's like medicinal or anything like that. Which I can't, I can't tolerate that. <laughs> I can. Ne- I have never been able to develop a flavor for that. But it's got that nice maltiness to it, um, and I really, I really enjoy that. But you're right, Matt. That cinnamon and Mark, you mentioned that too. That's like I, I think you said the cinnamon punch. Yeah, um, I, I get that as well. As soon as you take that sip, uh, you kind of get that maltiness, and then all of a sudden it's like, wow, there's that cinnamon that that hits uh, again. Ninety four proof, but a nice drinker. It's not not overly hot, not not warm, um, but a nice finish, just a nice mouthfeel again. Um, but again, I you know when you said that it was a little kind of leaves your mouth a little dry, but to me. And I, I'm not a fan of whiskeys that, that have that effect. I mean, I can usually, if I taste it and it does that, I'm like, yeah, not my thing. I really don't get that strong of an effect on that, on this one. Um, so it's not as, it's not as like old tub, for example, you know, which I think is a fine whiskey. I mean, $20 bottle, whatever it's good. But one thing that always stood out to me about that was the fact that it was drying, you know, I mean, I felt like I had to take a drink of water after I had a drink of that, but this one doesn't do that at all. So what, Mark, what do you think in terms of your palate and finish on this one? You kind of already talked about it a little bit, but. No, uh, no it, it, it does have that drying aspect, but it, it doesn't leave you like it's an anhydrous uh, where you have to have water. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's there. It, it's, it, it lingers a little bit, um, but, uh, I mean, it's still inviting to, br- to bring on another sip. Uh, yeah. I, I do like that cinnamon aspect to it. It really, it, it, that one carries on a little bit longer with it. Yeah. Along with some of the dark roasted uh, uh, barley notes that you get. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Cause I can feel that on my tongue, that, that sensation, kind of a tingle that just lingers um, on the palate, but that cinnamon flavor that, that also that tingle that comes with that, but that maltiness uh, goes on. Matt, I'm starting to pick up a little bit. You, I think you mentioned cocoa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm starting to kind of pick up a little bit of that too, as well as I'm sitting here just kind of enjoying the after effects of it. So very, very nice. You know what? One thing I want to ask you, cause you talked about uh, the single malt was the first thing that you all, that you all had, had gone with. I mean, that seems to be kind of a, a movement now in the United States. I mean, there seems to be a push. So is that something you all are going to continue to, to move into or is that, or are you just, Oh, we've been making it every year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, we, we continue on, we set down about 200 barrels a year. Okay. Um, with that, uh, I mean, unfortunately I didn't bring a bottle with me because we try that because that one really does bring a, bring in in parts, a nice sweet honey notes. Okay. Onto mm-hmm. it. It's a very light color. It's delicate. Uh, I'd highly recommend this for a light sipper. Uh, you don't need anything with this at all. Uh, if, if anything, you just want to cause 
sit on the sofa and, and cuddle yeah. up with it because it's just a real pleasant sipper, 87 proof. Uh, but we'll continue to do that. that. That's all aged at seven years. Okay. So uh, we're, we're hoping we've got uh, some barrels. We still have original barrels from 2008 that we haven't used wow. yet. So we've got, oh, wow. yeah. we're going to be coming out uh, sometime in the near future, some 13, 14, or 15-year-old bottled and bond of this malt. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's it's looking really good. Uh, nice. So we'll have some good aged uh, malt to carry that on with because we've got a, a good, every year we've got a good supply of barrels just to keep a little nibble going on that. Nice. So you guys are actually kind of ahead of the curve then on that single yeah. malt movement here in the States because that's something that, I mean, I know there's always been some people making a little bit here and there, but over the last year or two, it seems like it's just that category has really exploded when you think, Matt. I mean, yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, it's picked up quite a bit. Uh, you know, there's a number of distilleries that are doing it, uh, but also the TTB's got it out for public uh, comment right now. Right, right. And uh, I think uh, comments are due back by the end of this month. Yep. Uh, just from what I've seen so far is that majority of people just have some minor tweaks to it. Okay. Uh, they don't want to set a a barrel proof onto it like bourbon uh, because they're going most of the time it's going into second generation barrels. Right. And to really get those any kind of extract, you you want the higher alcohol. Gotcha. Going into it, uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to, to, to getting that classification taken care of. Yeah, I was gonna say because that just that just came out not too long ago, right? It, well, it, it's or, up for public notice right now, right? In so. in, uh, in, in comments, so as usual with the government, that it might be six six months more, right? So, right. Till, till they can adapt their their changes to the single malt category. So, yeah, but that'll be kind of cool to actually have a standard classification and the category actually defined in what it is. Yeah. So people can really comply and, and you know, every, there can be a uniform standard as to what production is. I, mean, I think most people are probably doing that for the most part anyway, I would assume, but um, I think that's probably going to be helpful for the industry as a whole to have that in place. So yeah. now you all, you all the still here on site, did you all ever, did you ever source uh the early Product? years, about, okay. about 2010, we did did source a little bit because we we're a sponsor of the FEI Games, and we wanted to get some product out, so we did source some at that time. Okay, uh, th those supplies are long gone. Gotcha. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but we did did source some malt, and we did source some bourbon. Gotcha. But I, I mean, obviously, that was just to do what you needed to do to yeah. to have product to to get by. But everything since then has been your own. Well, all, all everything that we distill, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's great because a lot of distilleries, you know, they still source some stuff and uh, and that's uh, what gets them by. So I tell you what, we're we're at the end of round two here, guys. So why don't we take a quick break, get a word from our sponsors, and uh, then we'll come back with more with Mark Kaufman, the master distiller with Town Branch Distillery, in just a minute. Three Chords line of whiskeys embody the spirit of creativity. The whiskey is a true collaboration between producer and composer Neil Giraldo and master blender distiller Ari Sussman. The three core team of expert blenders, coopers, and sensory professionals have developed a multi-step process they called perfectly tuned taste. This process begins by carefully selecting the finest bourbon and rye whiskeys from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Indiana, and then blending them together. Find out more about the whiskeys and distribution in your area at www.threecordbourbon.com. All right, everybody, welcome back for the third and final round of the Bourbon Life Podcast. I'm your host, Mark. And with me to wrap it up, he's still here, folks. Believe it or not, he stayed for the final round. It's my good friend, Matt. Matt, how you doing down there at the end of the podcasting table? Mark, I'm doing great. I would hope our listeners would believe you that I'm here. <laughs> You're not that kind I'm of guy, like, man. I'm not a 50-50, like, oh, That's right. Matt bailed on this one. Matt's here. You know, That's right. I, I usually usually make it through, right? Matt, the only time you bailed on me was this Sunday on the third day of the Bourbon Fest. You texted me and said, man... I got a lot of stuff to do. I just can't make it. And I was laying in bed at that time before you texted. And I was thinking, man, I hope Matt messages me and tells me that he doesn't want to go nice. back. I like how you put it all on me. <laughs> I'm the one that oh, had, yeah. Yeah. I was like, no, I'm, I'm done. I did Friday and Saturday, man. I yeah. couldn't, I don't think I could have done a third day at the uh, Urban Festival. We had so. three days of fun in two days. Yes, exactly right. We we definitely did. Well, we're having a lot of fun tonight too, man. We're well, tasting, certainly we are. Tasting some great stuff and we got some uh, more great stuff lined up. So you want to tell everybody who we have with us, Matt? Absolutely. Here to walk us through our last round of the Bourbon Life podcast this evening is Mark Coffin, the master distiller at Town Branch Distillery here in Lexington. And Mark, you didn't leave on us either. 
No, no. I mean, <laughs> this is a, a three-part series, and I really look forward to this third part because uh, we've got not only got, got a good bourbon, but we've got a little bit of uh, bourbon cherry cola to taste out. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. super excited about that one. Like I said, we were talking off, off air a few minutes ago, and uh, your team had reached out, and they said, hey, would it be okay if he brings <laughs> the bourbon cherry cola? I'm like... Are you kidding me? Yes, he can bring that for sure. Bring as much as he wants, because I'll be more than happy. Uh, I'm a big fan. I've loved cherry cola since I was a kid. Uh, and of course, you know, with bourbon, you can't go wrong with it. But yeah, we'll we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. But we well, might as well talk about it now. You're sitting talking here about talking about, about, about it, right? Just roll right into let's it. Let's just roll right into it then. So Mark, tell if you want to, tell us, tell us what we got here with the bourbonola. Well, as you can see, it's a prohibition style bourbon cola this was the prohibition style where the agents got the vanilla envelope cash under the table oh. uh, <laughs> to have alcohol in this yeah okay, okay. of course that that there is a uh, there is a tie to uh the atf or revenuers back in the, the 1920s with the lexington brewing company where uh they they uh got caught uh, with a couple pellets of high strength malt beer. Okay. Okay. And apparently somebody didn't get their vanilla envelope. <laughs> they they uh, arrested five people and then they took the two pellets of beer in the safest place in Lexington at the post office in the basement. After 48 hours, there was nothing left. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny how that happened? Yeah. But, but now this is, this is a nice uh, bourbon cherry cola with bourbon into it. Uh, it goes back to the Lexington Brewing Company had to, to change things back during Prohibition. They couldn't make beer anymore. So, so they went to the colas, and one was a bourbonola that, that they had made. So we, we resurrected that again and then put a little bit more of the bourbon touch into it, uh, add, add some cherry flavor to it, then also a little bit of a good, good bourbon. Yeah. Huh. So. Yeah, and this is, all right, so 1922, what's the, I'm looking at the label here. This is a really cool can. I mean, this looks very old school. Um, it looks like uh, something you would see from the 1920s or something. Yeah, unfortunately, they didn't can back then, though. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it was bottles. <laughs> it was all bottles. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, this is a really cool, it's black with a little bit of, uh, uh, it's not yellow, it's really more of a cream kind of color, vanilla colored, right? Yeah. Um, we call it, uh, but the label's the label's really cool. And this is 12% ABV, right? So yeah, this, this packs a punch. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, Matt, you're not partaking with us on the on the cola, man. But. I'll hold off on the cola. But is this the first uh, ready to drink cocktail that you all have put out? Or no, we we did some others. We did some uh, g uh, gin style ones uh, a few years before that. Okay. Uh, but this this one here, uh, we we went back to our roots. Something that 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 we're familiar with. Something that started with the Lexington Brewing Company. And uh, this is what we developed off of that to try to keep the, that same kind of history going. Mm -hmm. So, you, so you guys made the cola, is that what you're saying? Or did you say you made the cola? Did I miss that? Well, we made the bourbon. You made yeah. the bourbon, right? But, but yeah, not the I'm, cola. Not that the actually, cola. Okay, that's what I wanted to make sure that I, I wasn't sure. I was listening earlier. I was like, did he say that he made the the cola as well? Okay, sorry. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's pretty special if you guys can make your bourbon. Didn't make the cola itself, and then uh, put it all put it all together. So yeah, we wish we could, but we just don't have that that much of uh, real estate to. Get our part <laughs> yeah, you're too busy making everything else That's in right. the world. Yeah. It seems. But now you coming you, out of there. This just came out. You said uh, just like six months ago. Yeah, within right? the last six months. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the reception to it has been pretty good. Very I'm good, assuming. Yeah. yeah. Well, we just opened up in a local market. And now we're starting to spread our wings in in. in uh, getting into some other markets that's starting to develop quickly. So we want to be sure we're able to support what we had going on now. Then, then as we could see that we could meet the the production needs, we're expanding a little bit more. Well, that's great. That's great to hear. And this is, this is delicious. You've won me over. I mean, cherry cola, like I said earlier, I mean, off air, I mean, cherry cola as a kid was something I absolutely loved. Uh, of course I love bourbon. So you put those two together. You can't yeah. go wrong with it, right? <laughs> Yeah, this is this is delicious. So thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Uh, pouring this over ice, you know, this is something you could drink year round, uh, definitely in the spring and summer to refresh. But 
Um, you, you could even drink this, I think in the fall and through the winter. Um, I think it's a, it's a really nice, just a really nice drink. Very refreshing. I like that. Yeah. Matt, you're missing out, man. Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll get into it at some point. Maybe not this evening. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the distilling process that you guys have. Cause you, you use pot stills, correct? Yeah. We use foresight pot stills. Okay presently and um and we are looking at expanding that distillation because we're about at the limits of what we could do at the pot stills right now okay you have two is that right is that yeah what? okay yeah, it's a, it's a are you one of the still. sorry are you one of the larger producers using pot stills uh, i don't know i never looked at it that way mm-hmm. you know my old friend uh, dave pickerel yeah he uh we me and dave go back to the 1980s wow this is before he went to maker's mark yeah he went oh, huh. tech engineering and uh, we had talked a lot about it, and, he, and it was his opinion that, that our size of stills are about as big as you want to get on the pot still side. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, you really want to be going more toward uh, continuous column stills, more efficient at that point there. Yeah. Okay. And the pot stills for our listeners, it's kind of like you know driving a Volkswagen or something where you got to learn like the little tricks and the trades of each one right it's not as you, not as you're absolutely right structure. because our our pot stills are 100% manual mm-hmm. there's no automation uh we can we can read what a therm, thermostat has or, or what what a thermometer's got but everything's handcrafted uh, we we try to see where the heat is on the condenser uh, where the coolness is, uh, if it's getting a little high or a little low, it tells us a little more steam or a little less steam. Uh, we have to watch a window in the wash still. Is it starting to fluff up foam at that point there? If, if, if you start seeing some pillows of foam coming up, you got to cut back the steam because all of a sudden uh, it'll just flood out the whole system. And you don't want to do that. You know, it happens to every operator one time. And it only happens one time because that <laughs> operator's got to clean the whole damn system out. <laughs> yeah. So you don't let that happen. And it only happens at the beginning of, of the distillation process on the wash still. Mm-hmm. But but the heart of the work's done on the spirit still. And that's where the craft comes in, uh, where where we do a couple of tests, both with a the hydrometer. Then we also do a dilution test with a distillate coming off, telling us where to make the cuts. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first cut's critical. Uh, that's the high alcohols. You want to get rid of that, but that it, it's also got a lot of copper sulfate that the heads have, and that's that uh, bluish green color that you have. Okay. And the sulfate, of course, is coming from the yeast fermentation. Then it's a, a catalyst that binds to the the copper, and that's where you're getting the it copper pulls sulfate. that color. Okay. Uh, yeah, I never knew that. I never knew that happened. Yeah. Very and cool. and, and it, it's really critical. It's and copper is one of the the best properties that you have for distillation for for everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, for all whiskeys, you got to have some copper there. You just don't 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 use uh, stainless steel. You can have it, but you better have some copper there along the line. Uh, some companies, some big distillers, might have a big vat full of copper webbing in there. It goes through there, and 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 you picking up some of the sulfur compounds at that point there, or some are using, like us, we're using it off the still itself and off the condenser because it's 100% copper. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Now, when you're pulling that off, I mean, but you can take those heads. Can you go back and redistill those then with 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 other? With our process, the heads and tails stay in perpetual motion. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. We we keep putting it back into the low wines. And and that's, that's really... Uh, unique. It, it, I'm not st- not that it's unique, but it but it really continues your flavor profile for subsequent batches. Gotcha. So it just keeps going back and forth. The only thing you're pulling off is the the hearts cut. Yeah. Okay. And with the pot still, I mean, I've talked about this. Or we've talked about this before um, with the guys from Georgia. I think Matt do pot use a pot still as oh, well from uh, ASW. Yeah, ASW talking about their their distilling on the pot stills. But you can you can maintain. I mean, you're not distilling to as high a proof um, as with like a, with a column still because you can get up to 190 plus right. with those, right? But you're also able to maintain some cogeners that you're not able to keep in terms of a of a column still. Is that is that accurate or is that? Yeah, uh, your your a lot of your cogeners gonna come off on your tails. Yeah, uh, it's really an undesirable component. Okay, but it's really critical for your flavor profile for your hearts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there's a lot of that comes through. Uh, usually your, your tails are going to come off at about a 61% alcohol at that point. Okay. There. All right. And then we take the still all the way down to 0.1%. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, and I was going to ask you about that. What are you guys coming off the still at for your heart? We, we so come on a composite sample for our hearts cut. It's right at 68%, 67, 68%. Okay. So right. 100, 134, 136. Okay. For, and then when you're going into the barrel with that, what are, you, are you going at 125 on your barrels or does it matter? We go in at 120. Our okay. malt, we're going in at 125 uh, because we use a second generation barrel, but we've, we've lowered that just recently to 115. See how that goes. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's that's very cool. Very very good to know. I love also the, the rise at 125. Is it? Okay. Yeah. That's what I was wondering about that. And now your barrels, uh, and we talked about that a little bit off air, but you're not, you don't have a Rick House in downtown Lexington where you've got 20,000 barrels. No, no, there I, w- I wish we had, we do do that on contract. <laughs> so if you're listening, don't, don't come to downtown Lexington thinking you're going to find a Rick house full of, full of a lot of barrels. I thought they were underneath the post office. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They've all disappeared, man. But if someone's uh, yeah. interested in doing a single barrel selection, I'll, I'll, I'll bring juice some barrels, bring them in and we, we'll do a tasting there at the brewery. Or yeah. The distillery. The distillery yeah. yeah. Which is a beautiful facility. I mean, it's really nice. It's downtown. Um, just there off of, um, High Street, High Street, Max uh, or West Maxwell, Oliver Lewis, Oliver Street, Lewis, yeah, Pine yeah. Street, yeah. Cross Street, you <laughs> name it, it's right there. Yeah, there's a lot of streets that, yeah, it's kind of crazy, but it's a beautiful. Yeah, it is great. You can see the the pot stills right through the window, right? Yeah, as you drive yeah. Past, yeah, yeah. And we built that distillery in 2012. Okay. Uh, you know, across the street is the brewery, and that's where we had the stills originally uh, installed in 2008. But then when we decided to expand the, the distillery aspect, we put the distillery right behind that building. Mm-hmm. And uh, then after that, we uh, upgraded the brewery, and uh, we we built the shell around the old brewery. The oh, old yeah. brewery was a tin building with wooden structure. Uh, the brew house was in there, and uh, we installed a new brew house. Then we put the new shell in. Once we got that all done, without missing an hour of production, we took wow. down the building within. Wow, <laughs> wow. that's crazy! In a yeah. state of perpetual motion, just like <laughs> just like, like your heads, heads and tails. And tails right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, at yeah. the time we we couldn't afford to to lose a day's production with the beer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, now you guys are open for the public, right? Everything. Yeah, we're on the to, Bourbon Trail. Yeah, right. Uh, your tours are seven days a week, uh, yeah. every hour on the hour. Then we get in the busy periods, especially like Keeneland, we might go every half hour. Okay. And that's the being on the Bourbon Trail. I'm assuming that's. I mean, that's pretty significant, right? I mean, that's oh, yeah, that's yeah. great for you guys, right? Only, only distillery with a brewery on the Bourbon Trail, so you can yeah. you can taste the spirits and you can also taste the truly beer. something for everyone, right? That's, right? that's exactly right. Yeah, get some of that Bourbon Barrel Ale, <laughs> <laughs> and get some Bourbon Ola too, right? Yeah. So let's talk about what we have poured up for the third round here, um, Mark. If you want to, this is tell a us true what we cask, and this is actually our same bourbon. But it's a selection of about 40 to 45 barrels where we just blend together, and uh, it's at cast strength. All we do is filter out the char. Oh, okay. okay. So what? What this, this one here? I think is at a hundred and I can't. Nine. I can't even read it. Sorry. Like one hundred nine point <laughs> three. Okay. So you said so you guys go in at one twenty. One twenty. One twenty, right? So this drops a little bit. Yeah. In the in the in, well, in, I'll tell you, look, I've seen the, the trend on the barrels here in the last ten years. Uh, the trend's been going down, and I attribute that mostly just to our weather conditions. It's been not really hot. It hasn't been very dry, but very humid. It has been. Yeah. And and, and other than uh, you know, I, I see the same thing with our irish uh barrels that we age too is where there are a little bit more moderate temperatures between 30 degrees and 75 degrees but very humid too that they're they're they lose a a bit more alcohol and gain water so we're we're seeing almost the same kind of trend yeah um (laughs) you know i'm sure if if we were into a rick house that was four or five six stories where it's getting a little more heat up above would be a different right rick houses aren't that tall i got you okay great matt what do you pick up on this one it's got, I'm assuming this is the same 7250. Yep. Yep. Is there an age with it that you know? This is going to be run about the same five. Five, five, five and a half. Okay. It's funny. It's got a, a really different nose. It's it's fruitier yeah. to me. Pick up a lot more cherry, a lot yeah. more like bright fruit coming across, strawberries, um, like a little raspberry. But there's also like a creamy vanilla. Yeah. And marshmallow coming across. I think some of the sweetness is like a toasted marshmallow with it. I think a little bit more oak plays a role in this too. I think coming out at cast strength, we're getting a little bit more of the barrel interaction 
in the the aromas that I'm picking up too. Not yeah. as much, not as much of that minty rye spice, but a really great nose. I'm I really like what I'm smelling so far. Yeah, and I agree with that, Matt. That's the that's the thing that stuck out to me. One was the uh, the, kind of the cherry, you know, that that mm -hmm. nice fruity aroma that you talked about. Um, and then also that it didn't really taste, it didn't really nose like the bourbon, the naughty proof that we had almost completely different. Um, mm -hmm. more of that Oak is coming through the color on this one. Again, um, just beautiful, nice Amber color, uh, again, coat in the glass, very nice, good legs on it. So nice and oily as well. So, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, great, great nose on that one. So Mark, you talked a little bit about the single barrel program. So you do have that in place so yes. people can come out and select a, a bourbon or a rye or, or a malt or a malt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with that malt, I was going to ask you the question because, you know, when people think of scotch, you know, scotch is aged in Scotland for 50 years, whatever. Um, I mean, you're in Kentucky. So is that you're aging that here as well, yes. right? Yeah. We're, we're aging that here. We still have about 35 barrels from 2008. Yeah. When we started. So what's the impact of the weather here as opposed, I mean, cause I mean, is there a certain point where it's just like, this is, we can't go beyond this. Well, the, the angel share uh, definitely has an impact. Uh, we definitely don't want to lose too much of that volume in there. Most I've seen for the 2008, we're probably about 35, 40% ca volume capacity now. Okay. So it has been dropping. Mm -hmm. um, but, but with that drop too, also comes more intense flavors. Gotcha. So okay. uh, we'll, we'll test that out, taste that out a little bit here in a couple more months again. But I'm, I'm sure it's it's really coming on pretty nice. Yeah, I'm, I tell you these what, these are second generation barrels too. So that was going to be my next now, question. Now the key is that not only is it second generation, all of our malt we put into the second generation barrel that had our ale beer into it for six weeks. So after the beer comes out for the bourbon barrel ale beer, mm -hmm. we put our distillate into it. And that that really adds, I think, some of the sweetness to it because the the distill is going into a very wet barrel. I mean, it's been soaking could be 10, 12 years between the bourbon and the beer being in there. Right. So, you know, we don't quite get that that 2% loss right off the bat because it was absorbed into the wood. Mm -hmm. So so that, that has an impact on that flavor profile. Okay. Yeah. We're going to have to try the single malt. <laughs> I don't think there's any way around it. We absolutely are. Yeah. It's, it's going to have to happen, right? It's going to have to. There's no, there's no question about it. So, Mark, I, I usually like to ask our guests as well, since we're coming out of the whole COVID pandemic situation, can you talk a little bit about the impact, what, what COVID did, how it impacted what you guys were doing and your, your production and everything else that went along with that? Well, we were fortunate that, that we were uh, deemed essential. And that's nice because we kept everybody employed. Right. Uh, you know, some non-essential employees that didn't have to be on the floor or did office work, they were able to work from home. But on the most part, we were able to keep keep our employees employed the whole time. And, uh, you know, there were some hiccups with, with employees, you know, coming down with the illness and maybe off for a couple of weeks or have to, uh, you know, mask up for a while. But on the most part, we survived that pretty well. Uh uh, and we struggle like with everybody else with help right now. Yeah, uh, it's hard to get get good help and you know, mm -hmm. try to get find people to work. But on the most part, we've been very fortunate. Um, we got, we got some very good long term employees that have stuck with us, and uh, they're doing a great job. Yeah, that's that's good to hear. Did you have any issues in terms of uh, your your materials? You know, like the glasses, because we've heard people talk about glass problems, issues getting supply chain issues on the most faced. part we've been pretty lucky uh glass was an issue a few months ago for about three weeks uh we were able to get that caught up again uh, we've been really fortunate that our malt hasn't been affected yet but it has affected a number of other distilleries so uh you know we're, we're feeling the the pressures in the market because there has been dramatic price increases on various sure. things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, malt, malt, malt prices have gone up substantially. Corn's gone up substantially. Uh, now there's a threat of CO2 being short. Uh, that could affect our beer business. Oh, wow. And our bourbon cherry cola, our mm -hmm. bourbon ola here could affect that. 
Uh, so we're keeping a close eye on that. But, but we've been pretty fortunate, but, but we are having to absorb a lot of price increases that, that are hurting the bottom line. Yeah. And speaking of prices, we didn't mention pricing on this. Can you kind of give us an idea of what we're looking at in terms of? Yeah, our, our bourbon, you're going to find that anywhere from 35 to 42, the 90 proof. The true cask will be about 45 to $49. Okay. And then the, it'll be about the same for the the bourbon stout. Wow. Or the maple stout finish. That's Remark- remarkably <laughs> yeah. affordable in this market. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, we want people to drink it. Yeah. yeah, we, yeah. Don't want, we don't want those statues up there on the shelf that's not being drank. <laughs> yeah. No, but that's that's cool for a pot distilled five plus year product sure. coming here local out of Lexington. Yeah. And the glass itself is beautiful. I mean, the bottles mm-hmm. are gorgeous. I love the, the square design. Uh, the thick bottom is beautiful. I love glass bottles that have that thick bottom like that. Um, that you can see through, you know, and the, the, the liquid looks almost like it's suspended in the, yeah. in the bottle. Right. So in the, the, the glass is really quite durable. I think we've only dropped one where it actually broke. <laughs> um, and because I mean, it's really surprising how strong these bottles are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, it's beautiful. The whole design, the, the labels are, are unique. They're simple, but, um, they're really, they're elegant. I mean, that's a good way to, to describe it. And the glass itself is just, just really, really beautiful. Very nice. Uh, marketing it really stands out on a shelf no and, question and about I'll, it. I'll i'll let you know about that that's pierce's wife deirdre that's in charge of the design oh was it okay yeah. interesting mm-hmm. good to know yeah so she is like the margie samuels uh yeah. with the very, maker, very maker's much, mark very right? hands-on yeah uh yeah, and there, there's there's a few things you learn with the company and one is you don't pick colors and another one you don't mess with the grass so there's a whole lot more <laughs> uh, she, she, she's got a great taste for for this design uh, not only that she does all our landscape too with all our the, buildings okay she's very in, involved with our building designs too very nice now you guys also we talked about this earlier um but you also have the distillery in ireland correct that's correct yeah in dublin ireland uh we had first started distilling there in 2012. now now the story we got some scottish stills in lexington it didn't make our friends in louisville very happy oh we've known for many years right they're they're good friends yeah but but the opportunity was there. We were able to capitalize on it because they were very very fast. Sure, you know, yeah. Stills were running eighteen months then, just like they are now. Uh, but when we uh, decided uh, to do uh, some distillation for some Irish whiskey in two thousand twelve, and I called uh, Rob uh, Sherman up at Vendome and says, "Rob, okay, here's your chance. Here. We got a couple. I want a couple stills for Ireland. What can you do?" He says, "Mark, just tell me when you want them." So yeah, we, we uh, made had two pot stills made there in Louisville and shipped those to Ireland. Nice. We started up in a brewery in Car- County Carlo. Uh, then uh, a couple years later, Pierce came across his property in Dublin on St. James's Street, and it was an old Catholic church that had closed down in 1960. And it had beautiful Gothic stonework on it. It was built in the 1850s. Beautiful, just beautiful. You know, unfortunately, it didn't have any stained glass. It was all concreted up because people throwing rocks at it. It had been used for a grocery store and electric warehouse. It needed a lot of work, uh, but Pierce was insisted on buying it, and uh, he bought it. Uh, we figured two, three years we'd have it ready to put the stills in. Um, until we... Uh, we knew we had to take the concrete floor. But we only own the perimeter of the church in a way to get to into the church from the road. Okay. So, and it's only three acres at the site, but it's a, a cemetery that goes back to the 10th century. Oh, wow. First governor, <laughs> first mayor of Dublin's buried there. Oh, wow. And there's like over 300,000 people buried there over you know, a thousand years. Oh. Wow. So we thought we were pretty safe. You know, we knew bodies were buried up next to the church, up to the church foundation. We thought we were safe inside the church because it was built, rebuilt on an old church that burned down. So we, all the services would go underneath the concrete floor, which we knew we had to take up. So as we start taking up the concrete, we also found out there were a number of bodies. Oh, no. Oh, mercy. And oh. Before you know it, we had a number of archaeologists on site. Oh, yeah, right. The, the time kept dragging on, had to document everything and do everything right. So uh, before you know it, it was 20, 
18. <laughs> we finally got started. We finally oh, opened up. Oh, oh man. So, wow. It was quite a story there. No. <laughs> but, but it's a beautiful church. Just beautiful. Uh, there's a... Uh, went in there, uh, redid, had a local fellow, I think a fellow out of Woodford County do the stained glass, and it's just beautiful. Very nice. Uh, the stills are up there at the front of the church in the altar. Uh, it's just just really a uh, first-class job. Very cool. Yeah. And that's, so you do Irish whiskey, but you also do other things, too. Yeah, you got a box gins, here of, yeah. of gin, right? Yeah, we make some Irish gins. Uh, we, we do there. It's called a Hay, Hay Penny uh, brand, and also the whiskeys. Or, or uh, Pierce Lyons, and it's Pierce Lyons Distillery. It's on St. James's Street in Dublin, right across the street from Guinness. Very cool. So you get the RTDs that we're drinking the Bourbon Ola. So you guys put out quite a bit. Oh, you got the coffee flavor, the coffee liqueur as well, right? That's right. The, the bluegrass sundown. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, heard, that's a that's a crowd pleaser. Everybody loves that one. Yeah, I have not had it yet, but I've heard great things about it, and I'm a huge coffee fan. So definitely gonna have to try that one out, Matt. You're not a coffee guy, are you? <laughs> no, not one much for me. <laughs> oh man! So, Mark, we're we're getting close to the end of round three. But wait, we did we talk about the palette on this no, one? We, we didn't, sure did we? Dag on it, Matt. So let's talk about the palette. Sorry about that. No, not a problem. I'll kick it right off here. I love it. Uh, it's got a really great, like fresh honey cornbread palette to me right up front. That the grain that we had before where it was more grain to me, now it's coming sweeter, it's becoming baked, it's got this nice warming sense right off the front of the palate. A little bit of the fruit comes through too, but then again, sweet honey and that cinnamon. I think a little bit of the the heat, not as much rye coming through with this one like we had before, but at 109.7, did we say? Yeah, I think so. 109.3, yeah. 109.3, it drinks... Um, for anyone that might see that number and and kind of be thrown back, I don't I don't think it drinks overly warm at all. It's it's quite approachable, very yeah, very complete, very great palate, great finish to it. Nice warming heat, cinnamon comes back, some of that rye comes back on the end, and it's like nice vanillas, nice honey, nice corn, nice caramel, kind of all, everything you look for. How could I even add anything to that? <laughs> That's Matt's like the expert on that. You know, it's just like, let Matt say everything. And I just go, yep. That's right. That sounds great. Mark, did he miss anything? <laughs> no, I, I mean, he hit, he hit everything right on. It's just, it, it's really nice at the finish too, because it's a little bit cloying. It, it hangs there a little bit on the top of your mouth, mm -hmm. but, but uh, also it, 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 it's not drying. It, it, it keeps you moist, but uh, really carries through with the flavor profile. It's yeah. really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. So yeah, I mean, the three things you brought us tonight, Mark, thank you so much. I mean, they're, they're, They've all been very enjoyable. Really have enjoyed getting to taste through all all of these. So I do have to ask you, 35, 37 years ago, did you ever imagine <laughs> that you would be master distiller at, at a distillery in downtown Lexington, Kentucky? Never in my wildest dream. I mean, <laughs> honestly. I mean, uh, the, the company has been very dynamic, uh, very progressive. And with Pierce, he, he, the company is a reflection of his energy. Yeah. I mean, it was nonstop. You were in constant motion. There was You didn't have time to really think about it. Yeah. And that's that's a good and a bad. I mean, on, on over the three and a half decades I've been with the company, I look at it and say, gosh, darn, if I had to sit and think about it, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but, I get but, it. You get put into an area he had confidence in you to do something, and you just get on and do it. And yeah, very cool. Great. So you're like the heads and the tails. You're in constant motion, right? Yeah, perpetual <laughs> motion. Yeah. <laughs> so what would you say, if you had to say, what's been your favorite part of the whole journey so far? Do you have anything you can pinpoint to say? The experience, this? meeting so many people. Uh, I mean, just with a company, just meeting people worldwide. Uh, but but then you get into the beer and the, the distilled spirits aspect. How many more people you meet in the public that really enjoy the same thing and they want to hear your story? Yeah. They want to talk about it. They they want to enjoy your product, and then that's really enjoyable. Yeah. Well, that's why I mean, we just have a very small small part in the whole industry. But I, that's why I enjoy doing it, just to get to meet people like yourself, uh, and to share pours and just to share the stories. You know, because it's important for people to know who you are, who the brand is. Uh, and get to hear that story. So we're we're very fortunate to be able to to do what we get to do, and we we enjoy 
we enjoy doing that. So before we wrap it up, is there any any exciting news for the distillery or any products coming out that you'd like to share or yeah, say we'll, anything we'll about? We'll probably have a couple more products come out this next year. It'll be a bottle and bond. Uh, okay. Malt whiskey to look forward to. Next fall, we'll have a limited release of a uh, weeded bourbon. Oh, okay. Nice. Uh, that'll be coming out. Uh, that'll be five plus years at that point. Okay. Uh, and it'll be limited for a couple years because because of the quantity of barrels we got. But uh, what we've tasted so far, it's just been super. It's been dynamic. Very you know nice. I mean? um, I'm looking forward to seeing that product come out next sep- September. Great. And so where can our listeners find your products? Well, we're, we're in about every store that you'd find around Kentucky. Of course, Kroger's, Total Wine, Liquor okay. Barn, you name it, uh, they'll, they'll have us. What about other states? Any, are you guys in other we're states in about right 30, now? 30, 30? four different states. Now, okay. 35 states, and that, that, that keeps growing. Uh, our biggest uh, state besides Kentucky is Ohio. Okay. Uh, Florida does quite well. Uh, Indiana does fairly well. Uh Arizona's doing good. Colorado's doing good. California's doing good. Wow. All these these places are really picking up on the bourbon. Very cool. That's that's very good to hear. So, Matt, before we wrap it up, man, anything you want to add? Hey, Mark, thanks for taking the time tonight to sit down with us and chat and doing it in person. We really appreciate having you here around the table with us. And thanks for bringing everything you you brought, bringing uh, also the good vibes from Lexington and the community local to us here. We appreciate it. Yeah, well, thanks. I really enjoyed enjoyed being with you guys today and telling the stories. Great. Well, we appreciate it very much, Mark. Glad to have you here. Glad you're here in person. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, so I'm going to, well, I got to thank our sponsors, of course. We are the Bourbon Life Podcast presented by Visit Lex, uh, which is so appreciate since we're, we've are mm-hmm. we got Mark from Town Branch here in Lexington, Kentucky. Beautiful, sunny Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, it's a great place to come and visit. You know, I love living here. It's been, it's a wonderful place to live. No question about it. Um, if you get a chance, come here, Kentucky bourbon trail, you see town branch distillery, get you some beer as well. <laughs> Try that bourbon barrel L for sure. It's got my, my two thumbs up, big vote for that. The bourbon Ola. Hey, if you guys can find this goodness. Yeah. I'm a big fan of that, Mark. That's, that's really good. So, um, but thank you all for listening. We always appreciate our listeners. Um, like I said earlier, it's so cool to get to meet some of you guys at the Kentucky bourbon festival, but if you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out to us. You can find us on Instagram at the bourbon life. Also on Facebook, you can join our private Facebook group, the bourbon lifers. We'd love to have you as part of that. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email us at the bourbon life at gmail.com. Um, and I guess with that said, I'm going to wrap it up, send us home with our tagline, which is may your glasses always be full and may you keep on living the bourbon life. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Bourbon Life Podcast. Our mission at the Bourbon Life is simple, to share our passion for all things bourbon with you every week. And we'd really love to hear your thoughts on how we're doing. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at The Bourbon Life. You can also contact us by email at thebourbonlife at gmail.com. And you can always find us on your favorite podcast platform. If you have a moment, we'd love it if you would rate us and give us a review. So until next week, we hope your glass is always full and that you keep on living the bourbon life.